Did you read Captain Underpants as a kid? <laughs> of course you did. Everyone read Captain Underpants as a kid, come on. But have you ever gone back and revisited them? No? You enjoyed something as a kid and you don't go back to it as an adult in search of it being good to justify why you like childish things? Well, I do, and I'm here to tell you that they're actually good. And no, I'm not just saying that to justify why I like it. Seriously, there's a ton of great jokes you probably didn't get as a kid and humor you didn't appreciate the cleverness of. So, let's jump into the wacky world of the original 12 Captain Underpants novels to see what makes them so timeless. Also, I rank them all at the end, so stick around for that. We all probably- hold on a second. That's better. We all probably remember this one fairly well. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top, Harold is the kid on the right with a t-shirt and weird haircut. We all remember that now? They're best friends and they make comics together, most notably Captain Underpants. It was a time of darkness and despair for planet Earth. Bad guys had taken over the streets, and all of the superheroes in the world were too old to fight evil. Hey! <laughs> then came along a new improved, extra strength superhero. Tra la la! Look up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's an exiled sandwich! No way! I'm Captain Underpants! Captain Underpants was faster than a speeding waistband. More powerful than boxer shorts. And able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. Tra la la. Night and day, Captain Underpants watched over the city fighting for truth, justice, and all that is pre shrunk and cottony. They sell these comics on the playground for 50 cents. But Mr. Krupp hates them. They're constantly pulling pranks, and one day they take it too far. Mr. Krupp manages to get them on tape messing with the football game so he blackmails them into essentially being his slave. George and Harold obviously don't like this, so they order a hypno ring and use it on Mr. Krupp. As a joke, they hypnotize him to be Captain Underpants, but it backfires. He runs away and tries to fight crime. George and Harold manage to prevent him from being arrested, but then an explosion happens and he gets picked up by a van. Mommy, said a little boy sitting on a bench. I just saw two robots driving a van with a guy in his underwear hanging off the back by a red cape pulling two boys on a skateboard behind him with his feet. How do you expect me to believe such a ridiculous story? Asked his mother. This leads them to an adult baby in a diaper with two robots and he tries to use a laser to blow up the moon? Well anyway, they destroy the robots, turn off the machine, and capture Dr. Diaper. Great shot, Captain Underpants, cried Harold. There's just one thing I don't understand, said George. Where'd you get the extra pair of underwear? What extra pair? They get Captain Underpants to put Mr. Krupp's clothes on, but they can't figure out how to dehypnotize him. On a hunch, George pours water on Mr. Krupp's head, and that seems to work. But now, anytime he hears a snap, oh no, cried Harold. Here we go again, said George. Tra la la. Pretty simple. Honestly, it's a great starting off point for the series. It's more grounded than the series would gradually ramp up to be, but it still operates on cartoon logic. I love that the hypno ring just inexplicably works and they don't address how weird that is until book five. I mean, this is the book that started it all, and for that, it's perfect. It sets up all the ring jokes and moments, the first part being an introduction to the characters, the flipporamas, and of course, the oh no, here we go agains. Overall, just really good. George and Harold are back, George being the kid on the left with the flat top and the tie, and Harold being the kid on the right with the t-shirt and the weird haircut. Remember that now. They're pranking the invention convention this time. Last year, they pranked the whole school and got banned from participating, so they decided to strike back. They sneak into the auditorium to sabotage some of the projects, but Melvin, the nerd suck-up, spots them. The boys promise not to touch his project if he promises not to tell on them. He agrees. The boys then sabotage the projects and leave. The invention convention goes off and it's a disaster. Mr. Krupp blames George and Harold, obviously, but he has no proof until Melvin breaks his promise and tattles on them. George and Harold are sent to detention. While there, they create a new Captain Underpants book, Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets. One day at school, everything was pretty normal. The lunch ladies were serving toasted rat sandwiches, the principal was yelling, blah blah blah, and the gym teacher was being mean to everybody. 
My grandma can run faster than you guys. Then a UFO appeared. It zapped the school with that evil ray. The ray made all the toilets come to life. It made them evil, too. The toilets were hungry. Yum, yum, eat them up. So they ate the gym teacher. Help! The toilets just scratched somebody's car and ate up the gym teacher. Lord of mercy. Was it my car? They go to photocopy it on Melvin's Patsy, which he says makes pictures real, but the boys think it's just a trick. They try to photocopy their comic, but, of course, toilets come out and try to eat everyone. George and Harold run away and Mr. Krupp catches them out of class, but the toilets come in. One of the teachers snaps at it and Mr. Krupp turns into Captain Underpants. He leaves to collect ammo, but the toilets aren't phased by underwear. They head into the cafeteria and feed them cafeteria food to make them vomit up the teachers. But then, they realize that the Patsy still hasn't created the Turbo Toilet 2000. Just then, the Turbo Toilet 2000 breaks out of the school. They realize Captain Underpants obviously can't beat it, especially after being swallowed whole, so they create a giant robot with a plunger to defeat it. The robot easily defeats the Turbo Toilet 2000 and frees everyone. Mr. Krupp is worried he'll be fired for this, but George and Harold say if he agrees to drop their detention, they'll clean up the mess. He agrees, and they get the robot plunger thing to clean up the school. It flies the toilet and itself up to Uranus, and that's that. But, of course, Mr. Krupp is still hypnotized. So whenever he hears snapping, oh no, here we go again. Another great one. I mean, I like all of them, I think that goes without saying, but this is a really good follow-up to the first one. I think it plays it a little too safe and is just another Cat in Underpants book. It doesn't do much to continue the plot, it's just another thing that happened. This was sort of fixed retroactively, but still. Really all I wanted this to do was shake up the status quo like every other book does, but it's good for what it is. Book 3 starts, of course, with George, the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top, and Harold, the kid on the right with the t-shirt and the weird haircut. Remember that now. They head to school on a seemingly normal day, but on top of the roof is a UFO. Three aliens, Zorks, Klax, and Jennifer, start their plan, which will begin when narratively convenient. God, I love the meta humor in these books. Anyway, in George and Harold's science class, George and Harold are gaslighting their teacher by making animal sounds without moving their mouths, and somehow have convinced everyone in the class to pretend they can't hear it just to mess with the teacher. What a sick and twisted thing to do. They gaslight him so hard, he leaves mid-class to go see a doctor. Do you guys not understand what you've done? You've cause them to think they are going insane. He's gonna doubt his own perception of reality for the rest of his life. These kids are true evil in its purest form. They only exist to cause misfortune upon anyone that dares stand in their way. They hypnotize their principal, putting him in mortal danger, then unleashed a plague of toilets on their school. Now they're making someone believe they are insane? Why? for their own entertainment. Regardless of their war crimes, they get inspired by the volcano experiment to make the lunch ladies create an explosion of goop. Unfortunately, the lunch ladies decide to make a batch with a hundred times more ingredients, leading to an explosion that covers the whole school with goop. The ladies decide to quit, and just as Mr. Krupp is looking for new lunch ladies, the three aliens show up with fake sounding human names, Zorkset, Klaxet, and Jenniferette. Mr. Krupp, desperate, accepts them immediately, no questions asked. The next day, while George and Harold eat their lunch in Mr. Krupp's office as punishment, the new cafeteria ladies are turning all the kids in school into zombie nerds. So naturally, George and Harold go to stop this. They find the juice that turns them evil and pour it out the window to stop it from affecting anyone anymore. They go to try and warn Krupp, but he doesn't believe them. Then the aliens come in, and Krupp sees that, but one of them snaps their... tentacle, and Mr. Krupp once again becomes the amazing Captain Underpants. They run away and get cornered, but they find a ladder to the roof. A dandelion absorbed the evil juice they poured out the window and grew giant, so they run away to the spaceship. They enter the spaceship and find juice for self-destructing as well as superpower juice. They get locked up by the aliens, but manage to make them blow the UFO up. They survive miraculously, but the giant dandelion caught Mr. Krupp in his mouth. With no other choice, they give Captain Underpants the superpower juice and he gets the superpowers. With his powers, defeating the aliens is pretty trivial, and peace is restored once again. But now when Mr. Krupp hears snapping, he turns into Captain Underpants with superpowers. The Oh no, here we go again! So will be even worse for George and Harold now. This book is where the series really picks up. Captain Underpants is actually a superhero, which opens up the possibilities way more than when he was just a guy who thought he was a superhero. This book probably has the worst antagonist. I mean, I don't know what their motivation is to turn everyone into nerds, but still, they're great foes for a non-powered Captain Underpants. Anyway, on to the next book, aka the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> That's right, we're on poopy pants. 
So this book of course starts with George and Harold, George being the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top, and Harold being the kid on the right with the t-shirt and the weird haircut. Remember that now. But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. In the country New Switzerland, which is just south of Greenland if you somehow didn't know, there's an old tradition that everyone gets silly names, but outside of there it's not really respected. So you can imagine being a genius scientist named Professor Poopy Pants and being laughed out of every major scientific community would be hard, to say the least. But anyway, he is a device that can shrink things and a device that can grow things. Meanwhile, George and Harold are waiting to go on a field trip to Piqua Pizza Palace, and to pass the time, they do a prank. Unfortunately, Mr. Carp catches them and makes them clean the entire teacher's lounge instead of going on the field trip. Naturally, they set up an elaborate prank that covers all the teachers in paste and styrofoam pellets. The next day, the science teacher quits, citing the events of the last few books as the reason. It all started a few months ago when I had this dream that I got eaten up by a talking toilet. Then I started hearing cats and dogs meowing and growling in the classroom. Then I imagined that the school got flooded with sticky green goop. And just yesterday, I thought I saw a group of abominable snowmen chasing two boys down the hall. Now wait just a minute, Marty. All of that can be explained. And a few days ago, I thought I saw a big fat bald guy in his underwear fly out the window. Holy cow! You are crazy! What did I tell you? George and Harold caused the science teacher to go literally insane. They ruined his life. He has to go to a mental asylum now, or as they call it, the home for the reality challenge. He believes he's insane because the boy's pranks. Also, his name is Morty. Oh, jeez. Anyway, Mr. Carp is looking for a new science teacher, and somehow that makes it to front page news. He applies because he just genuinely wants to teach kids science, but of course they all laugh at him. All day. The next day, he brings in an invention, a mech for a gerbil. This briefly captures the kid's attention until Poopy Pants is asked what his middle name is. It's Pee Pee. Poopy Pants is one thing away from snapping. Then George and Harold get the genius idea to make a comic of Poopy Pants as the villain against Captain Underpants. Once upon a time in the city of Piqua, Ohio, there was a science teacher whose name was Pippi Poopy Pants. My middle name is Pee Pee. Everybody laughed at his funny name. Ha 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 This made Pippi mad. I'll show them. So he built an army of Gerbil Jogger 2000s. Ha <laughs> ha. He put a gerbils in each one. Hey man. But he couldn't make them do any evil stuff. Rats. Then he thought of an evil plan. But of course. He made a bunch of little headphones and put them on the gerbils. Hey. Soon, Professor Poopy Pants' army of gerbil jogger 2000s were off on an evil rampage. They all headed straight for the school. <laughs> Help! The gerbil jogger 2000s broke into the cafeteria! They just knocked over some cupcakes and now they're attacking the gym teacher! Quick! Somebody save the cupcakes! Anyway, this, of course, causes Poopy Pants to go insane. Once again, the boys actively contribute to the breakdown of their teacher. So he grows his gerbil robot to be big enough for him, then shrinks the school down. He then creates rules that everyone must follow his naming convention to get your own silly name, and anyone that doesn't will get shrunk. Of course, this doesn't go over well for Fluffy and Cheeseball, who go to Lumpy Potty Biscuits and transform him into the amazing Buttercup Chicken Fanny, but he refuses to go by that name. So Captain Underpants goes to grab the Goosey Grow 4000, but is spotted and shrunk again with the Shrinky Pig 2000 by Poopy Pants. Luckily, they still get the Goosey Grow 4000. They're about to use it on the school to grow everyone back, but Poopy Pants spots them and throws them off the roof. Luckily, Fluffy thinks quickly and gets Cheese Ball to make a paper airplane, which they then grow and fly away with. Unfortunately, it's about to go into a wood chipper, but it flies over at the last second. How convenient. Then a dog is about to eat it, but again, it flies up at the last second. How convenient. Then it lands in front of a steamroller, but it once again flies away at the last Second. What? Well, Tiny Captain Underpants was flying it the whole time. They grow Captain Underpants, and Cheese Ball's hand by accident, to be big enough to fight Poopy Pants. After a poorly timed joke, everything is set back to normal, and Poopy Pants is taken to jail. But not after George and Harold give him the idea to just not go by Poopy Pants. Unfortunately, the name he picks is Tippy Tinkle Trousers. Everything is fine, except that Captain Underpants is once again summoned. Oh no. Here we go again. Masterpiece. I think if you asked people as a kid what their favorite Captain Underpants book was, this would be the most common answer. Poopy Pants was easily the series most popular villain, and he basically became the main villain. He's pretty much Captain Underpants' as a Joker, and it makes sense that they chose him to be the movie's villain. But yeah, this is a really, really good book. For some reason, I always think this is the fourth book and Poop Pants is the fifth. But anyway, are you sick of the George is the kid on the left with the tie and flat top and Harold is the kid on the right with the t-shirt and the weird haircut bit I've been doing? Okay, me too. 
Anyway, George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top, and Harold is the kid on the right with a t-shirt and the weird haircut. Remember that now. This is one of their teachers, Miss Ribble. Get it? Miss Ribble? Miserable? Anyway, Miss Ribble is retiring, and she makes everyone make her a card. George and Harold, of course, decide to make her a comic instead. Once upon a time, there was a really mean teacher named Miss Ribble who was very mean. Grr, I'm am evil. She gave us lots of homework and yelled at us all the time. Read 250 pages for a test. Aw oh, man. One time, at Christmas vacation, she gave everybody 41 bug reports. How, how, how. Wake up, it's time to open your presents. I can't, I have to do my homework. After Christmas, everybody turned in a big pile of book reports. <laughs> then something terrible happened. Help! Miss Ribble was buried in a mountain of book reports. She's really most sincerely dead. No, she's not. We can rebuild her. Doctor, we can make her better than she was. Faster. Stronger. Eviler. When Miss Ribble got out of the hospital, she had bionic powers. I will take over the world. <laughs> So she made an evil costume. Her bionic beehive hairdo opened up to reveal a wedgie robo claw. Ouchies. <laughs> nobody can stop me now. Help! Wedgie woman is in the teacher's lounge. She just drank all the coffee and now she's giving the gym teacher a killer wedgie. Oh, the horror. She better make a fresh pot. Notice, any similarities to actual persons living or dead is very, very unfortunate. Of course, this makes her angry, so she sends them out of class. While waiting for Mr. Krupp, the secretary asks the boys to print out the Friday memo. So, of course, they mess with it. When Mr. Krupp confronts them about it, they explain. Then Harold comes up with the idea of making Mr. Krupp sign a blank card for Miss Ribble's retirement party. He does. So, of course, they write a proposal in the card signed by Mr. Krupp. Mr. Krupp confiscates the letter to hand deliver himself, only adding to the prank. After she reads it out, Mr. Krupp freezes all week until the wedding. All he can say is baba baba haba 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 wa wa. Of course, at the wedding, Miss Ribble refuses to marry him. Also, apparently Mr. Krupp is Jewish since they're being wed by a rabbi. So Miss Ribble refuses to marry him because despite respecting his cruelness, she hates his nose, which is a funny joke considering they have identical noses. Mr. Krupp reveals this was all a prank by Jordan Harold and Miss Ribble loses it and chases them down. She destroys the whole wedding, but the boys get away. On Monday, however, Miss Ribble reveals she's lowering the grades from C's and D's to F's and G's. With only one option, the boys decide to hypnotize her to reset their grades. Unfortunately, the company that made the ring is shutting down due to the dangers of selling real hypnotic rings, as well as the fact that women do the exact opposite of what they're hypnotized to do. Very convenient. Anyway, George and Harold, while hypnotizing her, decide to be safe just in case now that she will not become the wicked wedgie woman. The boys decide to sleep in their treehouse that night with their school clothes on so they don't have to waste time changing in the morning. Unfortunately, in the middle of the night, Miss Ribble shows up at their house as, surprise surprise, the wicked wedgie woman. She comes to them because she knows they know Captain Underpants, and she wants to kill him. During their little scuffle, Miss Ribble falls and knocks over the carton of extra strength super power juice. It spills all over her hair. No! yelled Harold as he grabbed the juice carton. This is the juice we got from that spaceship back in our third book. You mean the one with the annoyingly long title? asked George. Yeah, said Harold. This is extra strength super power juice, and a whole bunch of it you got in her hair. Don't worry, said George. None of it got in her mouth. What's the worst thing that could happen? Her hairstyle would have superpowers? Well, said Harold, I guess you're right. That is pretty stupid, even for one of our stories. It's pretty funny though, said George. You know, this isn't as funny as I thought it would be. She ties George and Harold up and creates robots of them to replace them in school as surveillance for when Captain Underpants comes back. They go to school, and Robo Harold accidentally kicks a kickball all the way into space. When Mr. Krupp accidentally snaps himself into Underpants mode, they spray him with starch, counteracting his powers. Or at least that's what Captain Underpants thinks, but it actually has no effect on him. With Captain Underpants defeated, Miss Ribble begins taking over the world. George and Harold escape and head to the newly opened store to get fabric softener. Unfortunately, the store that opened is the everything but fabric softener store. So instead of buying fabric softener, they retconned Captain Underpants' weakness with a new comic, The Origin Issue. A far time ago, in a galaxy long, long away, there was a planet called Underpanty World. Underpanty World was a peaceful planet where everybody wore only underwear. Haha, <laughs> I could see your underwear. I could see yours too. Ha <laughs> ha Hey, what are you doing under there? Underwear. Ha <laughs> ha, you said underwear. Hoo <laughs> hoo. Everybody liked wearing underwear so much that they never got into fights and they didn't have no wars either. It was cool. But one day, all of that happiness ended abruptly. Bad guys. The Wedgie Warlords had arrived. Hey boss, let's spray that planet with starch. Okay, I hate those guys. 
the good people of Underpanty World got us scared. So they ran to their leader, Big Daddy Long Johns. Help us, Big Daddy Long Johns. Okay, don't worry. I have a magic amulet that will protect us from starch. Yippee! But he accidentally dropped the magic amulet. Oopsies. It fell into the mouth of his newborn son, Little Baby Underpants. Oh no, he swallowed it. We are doomed. Just then, the Wedgie Warlord sprayed starch on Underpanty World. They send Baby Underpants to Earth where his new parents give him the name Captain. After Captain Crunch, of course. And the hero was born. Now Captain Underpants can counteract the powers of starch by saying a phrase. They get him to say it, then he leaves to go fight the Wedgie Woman. He defeats the big robots of George and Harold, but George and Harold come running out with extra strength starch so that Miss Ripple can't get it. But of course, she steals it from them. She sprays it everywhere, but then it's revealed George and Harold put fake labels over hair remover. So George and Harold get Captain Underpants back to Mr. Krupp, and then they rehypnotize Miss Ripple to not be nice and not be the wedgie woman. Then she does the opposite and is a nice teacher now. But like all Captain Underpants, it ends with the classic, oh no, here we go again. This is a good one. This book was one that I didn't read in the correct order as a kid because for some reason it was just really rare, and when I finally did find it in my library, it was missing pages. When I put it into the office to get it fixed, they made me write my name and class down so that, you know, when it was fixed they would let me have it again first, but I got moved classes so I never actually got it back. That's completely unrelated to what we're talking about, but I thought it was an interesting story. Anyway, yeah, this is a good Captain Underpants installment. It is everything. Great humor, challenges for our heroes, and status quo shifts. What more do you want from a book? This is also the last of what I call classic style Captain Underpants because this is the last book that doesn't end on a cliffhanger where the next book picks up, creating one long narrative. Anyway, on to... It's demonstration speech, aka fancy show and tell, in George and Harold's class, and they decide to show the class to do a cool prank called Squishies, which is where you put ketchup packets under the toilet seats so that when someone sits down, the ketchup sprays all over them. Normally, Miss Herbal would have hated this, but newly brainwashed, she loves it and lets the class do it to every toilet in the school. Melvin, remember the nerd from book two? However, does not approve of this idea and forces the class to watch his demonstration of his Combinotron 2000. He uses it to give his pet hamster Sulu a robotic exoskeleton, but after it refuses to do tricks for Melvin, he goes to beat it. However, newly powered up Sulu is able to beat Melvin instead. Melvin runs away and the class leaves to do squishies, so George and Harold decide to comfort Sulu and adopt him. Mr. Krupp gets squishied and naturally blames George and Harold, but the class vouch for them that they didn't do it. Melvin, however, speaks up and tells Mr. Krupp that it was their demonstration that taught everyone to do it. He gives them detention for that, so they decide to retaliate with a comic. The entire school begins laughing at Melvin because of the comic, so he steals one to read. Melvin naturally hates that the comic paints him as a big dumb tattletale, so he vows to teach them a lesson they'll never forget. He heads home and goes to combine himself with a big robot and becomes super strong, but because of his family's cat that he's allergic to is in his room, he accidentally combines himself with the robot and his snot, becoming the bionic booger boy. The next day, after George and Harold, George being the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top and Harold being the kid on the right with the t-shirt and the weird haircut, I bet you thought you were safe this time, but you never are. Show a trick they taught Sulu. Melvin comes in as a giant booger monster, and after George yells at the narrator for using such vividly disgusting descriptions, explains what happened to him. He says it'll take about six months to fix. Six months? said Harold. Hey, cellular separation is a highly complex procedure, said Melvin. It's not like building a robot, it takes time. George obviously suggests just flipping the batteries around. I mean, who wouldn't? That's the obvious solution. But Melvin shoots that idea down. For the next few days, Melvin is treated very differently. He wins every football game and has his own water fountain simply because he's that disgusting. George and Hild are just happy he didn't turn into a supervillain, seeing their track record of making comics of someone who immediately turns into a villain. Then flu and cold season starts, causing Melvin to start spewing. The next day, Miss Ribble is out with a cold for some reason, and Mr. Krupp is replacing her. What the heck is going on in this room? He yelled. What's with all the raincoats and umbrellas? Then Melvin sneezed. A few moments later, Mr. Krupp returned to the classroom with fresh clothes, a raincoat, and an umbrella. Then he announces that they're going on a field trip to Snotty Bro's Tissue Factory. At the end of the tour, the guide reveals that everyone gets a box of tissues from behind the red curtain with black polka dots. Unfortunately, tissues hurt Melvin and make him act strange and grow. The guide's insistent that Melvin takes tissues ultimately is what makes him evil. For some reason, the guide just keeps throwing tissues at him until he's massive. Because he's destroying the whole factory and putting people in danger, George and Hild reluctantly summon Captain Underpants, 
who really needs his cape. Gee, he said. I sure wish I could find a red curtain with black dots on it. Hey, said George as he pointed to the red curtain with black dots on it. Here's a red curtain with black dots on it. What a remarkably unexpected coincidence, said Captain Underpants as he grabbed the latest in a series of convoluted plot devices and tied it around his neck. Unfortunately, while trying to save Edith, aka Miss Anthrope, he loses his cape. You can't have your cape and Edith too. Double unfortunately, Edith decides to thank him with a big wet kiss, turning him back into Krupp. And before he's able to be turned back, he's eaten by Melvin. Luckily, just before Melvin eats George and Harold, Sulu hears their cries and saves them at the last second and fights off Melvin. While he's knocked out, his parents show up with the Combinotron 2000. George once again suggests the battery thing, and his dad tries it thinking it's dumb, but after it works, takes full credit. Unfortunately, while the robot and Bookers are gone, Melvin and Mr. Crupper fuse into one. So they blast them again, and they're separate! Yippee! But uh-oh, here we go again, because Mr. Crupp is in Melvin's body and vice versa. And uh-oh, here we go again, again! The robot parts and booger parts are still fused as three evil booger bots, and they destroyed the Combinotron. And that's where it ends for now. Maybe I'm biased because this was the only Captain Underpants I actually owned other than the first one, but I really like this one. I mean, sure, it's really short, but it's funny. And even though it doesn't conclude its own story, it introduces Sulu, and it's not like the rest of the books conclude its own story. Honestly, the Booger Boy isn't that great of an antagonist. I mean, they had to do some contrived stuff to make him evil, but still, overall a very solid entry. It picks up right where the last one ends. George, Harold, Mr. Krupp, and Melvin are running away from the Booger monsters, Carl, Trixie, and Frankenbooger. Sulu is able to shoot them into space so they're safe. For now. After a lot of confusion from everyone around Melvin and Krupp's body switch, George and Harold figure it out and give them new names to stop confusion. Krupp and Melvin's body becomes Kruppy the Kid, and Melvin and Krupp's body becomes Mr. Melvin. Mr. Melvin reveals that it'll take six months to build a new Combinotron, because it's not easy like a robot, time machine, or a patsy. And that gives him the idea to just go back in time and get the old one from the past. After Mr. Melvin discovers that Mr. Krupp is Captain Underpants, he realizes that if done properly, he can go back to his body and keep the superpowers. He tells George and Harold to create a comic about him as a superhero defeating Captain Underpants. So George and Harold go to do that while Mr. Melvin builds the time machine. He decides to do it in the library since it's empty. He gets the librarian to carry out a purple potty to use as the casing for the machine and gets to work. Meanwhile, near Uranus, astronauts discover the plunger robot in the toilets from book 2 on the planet. While distracted by the robots, they don't notice the boogers landing on the space shuttle. They hitch a ride all the way back to Earth. Meanwhile, Mr. Melvin discovers George and Harold didn't make a comic about him, but it's not as flattering as he hoped. He calls them into the library to punish them by making them test out the time machine he made. He sends them back in time to retrieve the Combinotron and replace it with a fake one he made. Before they leave, he gives them a memory erasure device and tells them not to use the machine two days in a row because it needs time to cool off, and if they don't, they could open an opposo dimensional reality rift that could destroy the entire planet. Anyway, they head back in time, arrive in the day before yesterday, and head to take the Combinotron. They manage to sweet talk Melvin's dad into handing it over, then sneaking behind a bush so they could swap them. They erase his memory, then head back to the library to go back to the present. Unfortunately, the librarian is there and takes the Combinotron and the Forgetchamacallit. She leaves to bring them to the police, so Jordan Hill go back in time 65 million years to get a pterodactyl for some reason. They use some crackers to tame a pterodactyl and head back to the day before yesterday. They fly off to get their stuff back, and while flying, Harold names the pterodactyl Crackers. But George doesn't want to name it since they'll just get attached. They land in her car, convince her she's dreaming, then fly them all back to school before wiping her memory. George tells Harold to take Crackers back in time, and Harold does so reluctantly. Harold leaves in the potty, then comes back half an hour later. George is suspicious of this, and Harold is acting suspiciously, but he brushes it off and they head back to the present. Meanwhile, in the present, Croppy the Kid is Captain Croppy the Underpants Kid is attempting to help people, yet failing miserably. So Melvin returns them to their original bodies, and when Captain Underpants goes to fly to help the people being attacked by the boogers that just returned to Earth, he realizes he doesn't have powers. Melvin, who now has the powers, refuses to help until George and Harold fix the comic. Truly the greatest hero of all time. Captain Underpants goes to fight the boogers, and George and Harold follow him because they would literally rather die than do anything for Melvin, which is a pretty based move if you ask me. Being chased by the boogers, they run to the everything except fabric softener store. They throw everything they can at them, and surprisingly it seems oranges are their weakness. Captain Underpants, in his first demonstration of being anything close to smart, 
baits the boogers with the underpants dance to try and attack them on top of a toilet, but actually uses the toilet to spray them with orange juice with the power of squishies. Melvin flies in and takes credit for the defeat, much to the ire of our heroes. Big Melvin, his superhero name, writes his initials using laser vision that Captain Underpants apparently had. That's funny, said George. Big BMs have always made me think of you. Big Melvin tries to convert Captain Underpants, but fails, and George and Harold use the distraction to refuse them and unfuse them giving Captain Underpants' powers back. George then wipes the memories of the event from the news people and anyone watching. Melvin throws a tantrum over losing his powers. Then the people Captain Underpants upset it's Captain Crappy the Underpants Kid come to get Melvin as George and Harold return Captain Underpants to his crappy self. George and Harold then go back to their treehouse, and George finds out that Harold never returned crackers to their time, but instead brought them to the treehouse. They decide to let them stay for the night, but will bring them back in the morning. The next morning, they go to the potty to bring crackers back, but they choose to ignore Melvin's warning about using it two days in a row, and it goes bad. But before I can tell you that story, I have to talk about this story. So, part two, huh? Really expands on the deep themes of the first one and really dives deep into the character of George and Harold. I'm kidding, of course, but this is a really good follow-up to the first one. I remember as a kid, the Squishies callback blew my mind. It was a crazy twist. Also, this was the introduction of time travel to the series, which is in every subsequent book. I'm sure you're all dying to know what happens next, so let's go back to George and Harold. George being the kid on the left with the tie and the flat. Weird haircut. They emerge in the library, but not the library they know, because this one is a bunch of books and a nice librarian. Also, Melvin is stupid here. They leave the library and slowly realize everything is wrong. They put Crackers and Sulu in their locker and head to class. On the way, they rearrange sign letters, but Mr. Krupp catches them in the act. Weirdly, instead of getting mad at them, he finds it hilarious. Also, he isn't wearing his toupee. That's when George and Harold, another version of them, walk in. They rearrange the sign to say Anarchy Rules before walking away. This is where George figures it out. They've been transported to a universe where everyone is the opposite of who they are in their universe. Harold doesn't believe him because that sort of thing only happens in poorly written children's stories whose authors have clearly begun running out of ideas. So George brings them to the cafeteria, but instead of being disgusting, it's actually really good. Then they go to the gym, where instead of children being berated for being overweight, the teacher is being nice. Then they go outside and all the villains are serving the community. The Turbo Toilet 2000 is a crossing guard, Poopy Pants and the aliens are firemen, Dr. Diaper is a cop, well I guess they're not all good guys, and the Robo Boogers are construction workers and postmen. Immediately, George and Harold realize they need to get out of there, so they go to grab Crackers and Sulu from their locker, but they're not there. Evil George and Harold took them, but left behind a comic book explaining their version of the Captain Underpants, or Captain Blutterpants for them, lore. Basically, they made their nice principal an evil supervillain that obeys them, and every time he gets water on his head, he turns into Captain Blunderpants, and any time he hears snapping, he turns back into Mr. Krupp. Eventually, the police came to arrest him, but he got superpowers from a collision between a peanut butter truck and a chocolate truck, along with the pizza he was holding. I don't know how that translates to him getting superpowers, but let's just go with it. They spot their evil versions carrying Crackers and Sulu home, so they go after them. When they catch up, they're hypnotizing the pets to be evil and obey their command. Unfortunately, the evil versions spot our George and Harold and command them to attack. Sulu jumps right at them and is about to kill them when Crackers flies in and carries them up into the sky. They think Crackers is going to drop them, but weirdly, it doesn't happen? Weirdly, every time they refer to crackers with he, him pronouns, they get italicized, which George directly calls out. If you didn't figure it out by now, you're gonna have to wait, because George and Harold didn't either. They return to the school and head to the library to get back to their universe and are gonna come back for Sulu. Unfortunately, Mr. Krupp starts chasing them because he wants to pet crackers. Double unfortunately, Evil George and Evil Harold catch up to them, and they all get transported back to the main universe. George and Harold make sure they're in the universe before escaping to their treehouse. The evil versions also arrive and quickly turn Mr. Krupp into Captain Blunderpants. Meanwhile, George and Harold grab their hypno ring and prepare to drink the super power juice, but are interrupted by George's dad who reminds them that they're having dinner with their families, including George's grandma and Harold's grandpa. They place the super power juice on the table to show them a comic they made of them as super geezers, and before they can grab it again, the grandparents pour themselves a glass. While distracted, they don't see the three evil versions climbing up the ladder to their treehouse. They find the Goosey Grow and shoot Sulu with it, growing him to massive size. Everyone inside runs outside due to the commotion. George and Harold grab their things and fly on Sulu to get to safety so they can get their powers. Unfortunately, it's empty. Out of options, they fly to Mr. Krupp's house, which is the best gag of all time. A bunch of signs with inane rules, and one that says, do not read this sign. Just perfect comedy. They turn him into Captain Underpants and fly back to fight Sulu. They beat him easily, but unfortunately, the evil versions are here, 
rearing up for a fight. Wait a minute. Dark versions of heroes who are opposites? Evil and good pets? Where have I seen this before? Wait. Oh. Oh no. So anyway, this is a tense moment, so I'm just going to read straight from the book here. Instantly, the mood shifted. Everyone stood back. The air crackled with tension. The showdown of the century was about to begin. Captain Underpants would soon engage in a historic battle with his evil twin. Never before had our brave hero encountered an enemy who was so powerful. Pound for pound. Superpower for superpower. Captain Underpants was pitted against his equal. He had met his match. It was about to be the ultimate smackdown. An all-out war. The brawl to end all brawls. The definitive clash between good and evil. A momentous confrontation of the most critical. They snapped their fingers and turned Captain Blunderpants into Mr. Krupp. They quickly tap their evil versions and Harold makes the rookie mistake of saying nothing could go wrong. Of course, this jinxes them and it starts raining, turning Captain Underpants into Mr. Krupp and good Mr. Krupp into Captain Blunderpants. Captain Blunderpants easily breaks out of the rope while Mr. Krupp walks home. George and Harold take off with crackers, but their evil versions follow close behind. They make it to their treehouse and find the Shrinky Pig 2000. They're going to use it on the evil versions, but Captain Blunderpants grabs them before they get the chance, and evil George and evil Harold take the Shrinky Pig. Captain Blunderpants is about to kill them when they're interrupted by the grandparents. Of course, no one is intimidated by their threats, but they activate their super geezer powers. They fight Captain Blunderpants, easily beating him, but evil George and evil Harold have the contingency. The Shrinky Pig. Luckily, the evil versions are kind of stupid, and Harold convinces them that they're holding it backwards, leading them to shrink themselves. George and Harold adequately punish them. They fix Sulu, return the evil versions to their timeline, and Harold makes the same mistake he did a couple pages ago, jinxing them. The cops immediately come to arrest them for the crimes their evil versions did, and... This seems familiar for some reason. Wait, no, not again. Now I know what's going on! He has mistaken me for the likes of you! Chaos Control! Sorry, I don't know what keeps coming over me. Uh, anyway. Harold makes the same mistake AGAIN and immediately Poopy Pants, now known as Tippy Tinkle Trousers, appears and freezes the cops. And oh no, here we go again. I love alternate universe evil version shenanigans. And even though this book isn't daring enough to do the underpants v blunderpants fight, I still love it. Though, this book does kind of feel anticlimactic, even if that is the joke, I still wish they did that fight at the end. I know I said I consider Wedgie Woman to be the end of classic style Captain Underpants, but I consider this the end of the classic era of Captain Underpants, if that makes any sense. It might seem like those are the same, but l let me explain. Classic Style is a standalone book that wraps itself up and ends with an oh no here we go again that sets up nothing, whereas after the classic era, the books start giving conclusions to things they set up and wrapping up the overall narrative, which you'll soon see. Okay, let me preface this one with this. This book starts having very confusing time travel mechanics, so I'll have a little graphic in the corner that'll keep track of it for you. Anyway, let's get into it. So Tippy appears and freezes the cops arresting George and Harold. But that's not what was supposed to happen. You see, Tippy and his giant ice ray zapping robotic trousers weren't supposed to be there at all. They had come from the future and rudely interrupted what was supposed to happen. Unfortunately for Tippy, the simple act of sending himself backward through time would end up being a terrible, terrible mistake. A mistake that would ultimately lead to the destruction of our entire planet, more or less. What was supposed to happen is George, Harold, and Mr. Krupp get arrested. George and Harold get sent to juvie, whereas Mr. Krupp gets sent to prison. Poor Mr. Krupp. He'd been locked up at the Pequa State Penitentiary for months, and the life of a jailbird just wasn't his thing. All day long, he had people bossing him around. He ate nutritionally deficient, horrible tasting meals in a filthy cafeteria. He got bullied constantly by a bunch of meat-headed thugs, and he spent his days doing menial busy work in an overcrowded, poorly ventilated sweatshop. Mr. Krupp was told when to eat, when to read, and when to exercise. He even had to ask permission to go to the bathroom. He was constantly bombarded with pointless rules, ridiculous discipline, random searches, metal detectors, security cameras, and pharmaceuticals designed to make everyone compliant and docile. It was a lot like being a student at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. 
except that the prison had better funding. Krupp discovers Teppy Tinkle Trousers working on something underneath a tarp. After the two squabble, recognizing each other but not knowing why, it's revealed he's building a statue for the warden. Of course, it's obvious it's a ploy, but he manages to keep the warden from looking into it through abject flattery. Later, the unveiling is happening, and Tippy reveals it's not a statue, but a robot. Tippy suddenly remembers that Krupp is the principal of the school George and Harold go to, and forces him to show him where George and Harold are. Krupp of course obliges and they head to Juvie, after facing a couple cops of course. Meanwhile, George and Hild are living it up in Juvie. To them, it's just a better school. As the two bullies discuss the similarities between elementary school and forced confinement in a harsh authoritarian penal institute, they heard the sounds of booming footsteps getting louder and louder. After some light convincing, the director of the Juvie hands George and Harold over to Tippy. Tippy lets Mr. Krupp go as he served his purpose, and George and Harold turn him into Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants leaves to go find a cape, while Tippy is a breakdown over the fact that the guy he just had in his hand and could have easily crushed was Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants finds a cape at the Everything Except Fabric Softener store, which luckily is having its semi-annual lazy storytelling sale. What a relief! He then flies back to save George and Harold from the grasp of Tippy Tinkle Trousers. He gets knocked around, dropping George and Harold into bushes safely. He then tries to freeze Captain Underpants, but he's too quick. After chasing him to the school, Captain Underpants manages to get Tippy to freeze himself in place. Captain Underpants starts ripping off the torso of the robot, so Tippy quickly dashes down to just the pants. Then, Tippy travels back in time five years. Now flashback five years, 11 days, 14 hours, and six minutes. Enter six-year-old Harold Hutchins. His parents divorced, and his dad moved to Nevada six months ago, which is hard for Harold. He doesn't talk much, instead spending most of his time drawing a lot of pictures. To Harold, this was any other day at school. He prepared like any other day, not knowing that this day would change his life. Harold goes to leave for school, and his mom suggests Harold go and introduce himself to the kid who just moved in next door, but Harold doesn't really care. She hands him his lunch money and sends him on his way. But Harold knows he'll never get to use that money. It'll end up in the hands of his 6th grade bully, Kipper. Kipper was the biggest kid at his school, and he was Mr. Krupp's nephew, so he was untouchable. He and his counterfeit cronies went around stealing lunch money from the kindergartners. Anytime Kipper would be in trouble, all he had to do was call his uncle, who would always take his side. Harold spent his entire walk terrified of him. He used the things on street as hiding places, dashing from hiding place to hiding place, making sure Kipper and his friends were nowhere in sight. Unfortunately, one of these spots was behind a sign for a gas station. The owner of the gas station didn't like Harold being near his sign, so he dragged him out into view, and the commotion alerted Kipper and his gang who proceeded to mess with Harold with the approval of the gas station manager. Billy, the manager, watches this happen and tells Harold he needs to learn to stick up for himself, or else people are going to bully him his whole life. The bullies drag him away, much to the joy of Billy. Enter five and three quarter year old George Beard. He and his parents just moved next to Harold from Michigan. He is a gifted kid who learned to read and write when he was four, and scores higher than kids twice his age. His teacher suggested he skip a grade, but his parents wanted him to stay with kids his own age. There are pros and cons to this decision. He developed great social skills, but he also gets into a lot of mischief due to boredom. He never liked school, but preferred skateboarding, monster movies, reading comics, and writing. His silly stories, like the fart that ate Detroit, would often get him into trouble. Anyway, his parents are making him wear a tie on his first day at school, much to George's protest. George leaves on his skateboard and heads to school for his first day. It's a pretty pleasant ride, until he arrives at the gas station and witnesses the 6th graders bullying Harold. He watches the whole exchange, and it infuriates George. Side note, this drawing of Harold is so sad, yet so cute. I feel so bad for Harold in this book. He's literally helpless. And the person who should be helping, the adult, is encouraging the behavior. Absolutely reprehensible behavior. Anyway, George decides to mess with Billy the only way he knows how. He takes off some of the letters on his sign to say, Free Bra Inspection. Billy obviously gets angry at this, but it doesn't take long for George's plan to work. A bunch of women pull over and begin beating him up. George, the smart Alec, spits his advice right back at him. You gotta learn to stick up for yourself or people are gonna bully you your whole life. George then continues on, looking for the bullies. He finds them in the parking lot tearing up Harold's drawings. George tells them to leave him alone, and they come over to beat him up. George, however, has a better idea. He uses his tie to whip them like Indiana Jones. He absolutely bodies them, but of course, Kipper calls for Krupp, and they get detention. He leaves them in detention together, and they quickly bond, learning that they share a creativity when they would harness together and create their very first comic, Dogman, which I feel is the book equivalent of a backdoor pilot for Dav Pilkey to pitch Dogman to Scholastic, but honestly, the Captain Underpants books were so popular, they probably would have taken whatever he had after it ended. But that's besides the point. They finish it as the bell rings and walk out. 
They find Kipper bullying more kids, but George threatens them with his tie, and they run away. George decides he's gonna wear a tie every day from now on. They bond more on their walk home, talking about bubble gum and peanut butter and gummy worm sandwiches, and decide to hang out for the day. They eat their sandwiches and decide to get revenge on Kipper, and then begin formulating a plan so devious, so diabolical, so delightfully devilish, so another adjective that starts with D, delicious, that Kipper would never think of messing with them ever again. They take note of his schedule, how he always unlocks his locker the same way and places it on top of his locker, how he puts his phone and bag of stolen money in his locker before wrestling every day, everything. George comes up with a brilliant plan. Rather than steal his key, which he keeps around his neck, They'll swap out his lock with their own lock by buying the same brand lock as him. Then, they buy a friendship bracelet kit. Harold is very confused, but George assures him it'll make sense. They then formulate more plans and collect more resources, taking a long roll of shelf lining paper, measuring it carefully. They find some old pants and shoes and create stilts with them. They store all this stuff in a bathroom stall at school, using the fake legs to make it look like someone is always in there. Therefore, their stash will be safe. Then they continue the day like normal. In the afternoon, five minutes before the bell, they set up their plan. They rolled the paper over Kipper's locker and placed their decoy lock on the paper a couple of lockers down. They wait for Kipper to place his lock on top, then pull the paper so their decoy lock takes the place of Kipper's real lock. Kipper then leaves, locking his locker with their lock. Lock, 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 lock. They break in and Harold takes the stolen money while George types on Kipper's phone. After they secured the money and sent the text, they put the friendship bracelets in a letter in Kipper's locker. They then went to the gym and left another letter in Kipper's shoes before leaving. Kipper finds the envelope which contains two friendship bracelets supposedly made by the cheerleaders. He puts them on and goes to show his friends. Meanwhile, his friends get a text saying they should make friendship bracelets and whoever makes the best one gets a big kiss. Kipper strolls up with the bracelets, confirming what was said in the text. Kipper then opens his locker, see the money is gone, and finds the bracelet kit, further confirming the text. Kipper tries to explain he didn't write the text and that the cheerleaders made the bracelets, but of course the cheerleaders deny it since they literally didn't. Finally, he opens the letter in his locker, which just says, I'm coming for you, signed Wedgie McGee. Meanwhile, on their way home, George and Harold buy dresses from the thrift shop. Later, they order pizza for the kindergartners for tomorrow. On their way to school, they drop off money, coupons, and instructions to the mail slot. They arrive at school early and unload their supplies in their stall. As kids begin to arrive at school, Kipper stands at the entrance. But rather than steal their money, he's trying to figure out who Wedgie McGee is. Of course, no one knows, until George and Harold start spreading rumors that he's a ghost that wants revenge against Kipper for being mean to the kindergartners. The Gossip Girls spread this all around, and within the hour, everyone knows the truth about Wedgie McGee. As Kipper and his friends argue about whether Wedgie McGee is real, the pizza guy shows up with the pizzas George and Harold ordered. He explained that someone named Wedgie something paid for them and that no one has ever seen them. The kindergartners enjoy their lunch for once. Then, after school, George and Harold repeat the process. They switch the locks, plant the embarrassing thing, and send the incriminating text. Of course, the same thing happens, only Kipper is angrier this time. He reads the note, and it says, There is no escape. Signed, Wedgie McGee. The next day, it repeats again. Pizza for the children, dolls for Kipper. This time, however, Kipper goes mental and freaks out. But he seems to have a solution. A new lock. He starts demanding more money from the children, convinced Wedgie McGee is not real. He has a pick-proof lock now, so no more pranks. When the pizza shows up, Kipper and his goons take it and eats it in front of the kindergartners. After school, George and Harold go to the stall. George has an idea and stands on the stilts and pulls them up, looking to the fly. He walks around, but for this to work, he needs to get rid of his afro. Then, for their backup plan, they put shaving cream in Kipper and his friend's lockers. They run out, saying they've seen a ghost that was leaving behind ectoplasm. The cheerleaders, curious but scared, run into the school to investigate. The boys come out, laughing at the girls for being so scared. But when they open their lockers, the ectoplasm rumors were confirmed as it spills out all over. All the boys run away, and Kipper huddles up into a ball crying for his uncle. Unfortunately for George and Harold, Mr. Krupp uses the same brand of shaving cream they used, beating the haunted school allegations. The next day, George and Harold create a new comic, which they then age with dirty water. Then, they order a pizza with double ghost chili peppers. After that, they cut George's hair to be flat. George then decides to keep his hair like this because he likes how it looks. The next morning, they baby powder the comics and staple them together, creating four copies. At school, the bullies had turned into monsters due to the Wedgie McGee debacle. Then, the pizza guy brings the pizza. Once again, they go to eat it in front of the kindergartners. But this time, it's super spicy and they all run to the water fountain before grabbing a bunch of milk, spilling it all over the floor by accident, then looking it up. The kids, of course, record this and put it online. When the bell rings, George and Harold head out to the shed on property and collect spiders and comment on the approaching storm. They pour the spiders into the lockers of Kipper and his gang. Then, they replace all their deodorant with extra spicy jalapeno cream cheese. 
To end it off, they slid the comics they made into their lockers and placed a walkie-talkie on top of Kipper's locker at full blast. And, as distant thunder could begin to be heard, they ran off to the bathroom just as wrestling practice ended. Kipper and his friends come out and discover what happened to their lockers. Luki, the arachnophobe, began to freak out. Then, Kipper discovers the comic, The Curse of Wedgie McGee. A true story. It's about a kindergartner that was bullied and accidentally turned his pants into a ghost before dying of embarrassment. His pants, however, haunt the school bullies for revenge. It makes them want to play with dolls, leaves white ectoplasm, makes food spicy, and makes their armpits burny. It then claims to undo the curse, you have to undo all the bad stuff you did and never pick on anybody ever again. Finally, they're all convinced of the existence of Wedgie McGee, even more so as their pits begin to burn. George and Harold hear them start crying through the walkie-talkie then start talking as the voice of Wedgie McGee, causing the boys to sob, hit themselves, and pee their pants. Mr. Crop began stomping towards them, but they assumed it was Wedgie McGee. They decide to hide in the bathroom. Unfortunately, that's the bathroom George and Harold are in, and they catch Harold putting the finishing touches on George's Wedgie McGee costume. They ask him what he's doing with the pants, but he doesn't respond. He knows their lives will soon be over. He hears the approaching footsteps. George, not knowing what's happening, takes wobbly steps forward as the boys shriek and tell Harold to get away from the pants. Then, Harold comes up with the perfect response as if an angel whispered in his ear, What pants? Suddenly, the time seemed to stand still. The four bullies stepped back in horror. Their eyes grew impossibly wide. They opened their mouths to scream, but not a sound came out. George took another step toward the bullies as they clawed at the walls behind them. Then the lightning flashed again, and everything went dark. The terrible storm knocked out a power line nearby, and the school was now completely black. Kipper and his thugs scrambled over each other, desperately trying to make their way through the restroom door. Mr. Krupp was to be their next obstacle. He had finally reached the lockers when the lights went out. His elephantine footsteps had stopped cold, and he stood in the darkness, breathing heavily and sweating abundantly. When the four squealing derelicts finally tumbled out of the restroom and bolted down the dark hallway, they smashed right into him. Nobody would be able to blame the bullies for what they did next. In their profoundly petrified perceptions, they must have believed that Mr. Krupp was some kind of giant, wet, fleshy monster, and they treated him as such. Screeching and wailing in the darkness, they kicked and clobbered the warm, wet, bulbous creature with all the strength they had. The four distressed delinquents then tumbled down the stairs and shoved their way through the back door of the school. As they ran across the football field toward their homes, Something about Kipper and his friends changed forever. They would never again be the same despicable bullies they once were. On Monday, Kipper begins apologizing and giving everyone their money back. All the bullies were being nice and giving back. Carrying bags, handing out bubblegum, offering free wedgies, the works. They eventually paid back all the money, fully reformed. And they all lived happily ever after. At least, that's what was supposed to happen. Not what actually did happen. Remember back in Chapter 8 when Tippy Tinkle Trousers accidentally froze his giant robo legs to the school's football field? Well, if you recall, Tippy got out of this jam by zapping himself exactly five years earlier. Now, see if you can guess which night occurred exactly five years earlier. Yep, that's right. Tippy time traveled back to the night we just witnessed, where George and Harold finally completed their revenge plan. The bullies ran out of the school across the field, but this time, something terrible, sad, and incredibly horrifying happens. Tippy's giant robot legs appear just as they run out. Tippy unintentionally became the ghost of Wedgie McGee. This causes the boys to fully lose their minds. Kipper is the first to fully lose it. He can say nothing but ba 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 ha ba ha ba ha ba wa wa as he slaps himself over and over again. Bug tore off his clothes and began hula dancing and singing, I'm a little teapot. Loogie started digging a hole with his teeth and Finkstein could do nothing but laugh, bashing his head into the grass over and over. Once again, George and Harold gaslit so hard they caused insanity. Tippy sees this as kids being weird before time traveling four years into the future. The next day, the boys are admitted to the home for the reality challenge, and Mr. Krupp was blamed for this and he loses his job. Meanwhile, four years in the future, Tippy comes out to a destroyed Earth. There's dead toilets, meteors all over, and giant zombie nerds. Tippy questions where Captain Underpants was for all this, but no one knows who that is. Tippy realizes what he's done. He must have altered the timeline to the point that Captain Underpants never existed. He realizes his mistake and goes to go back, but, well, I'll just show you what happens. And that's the end. Dr. Diver blew up the moon, talking toilets took over the world, and zombie nerds took over the earth. All because Mr. Krupp wasn't able to be hypnotized. So that's it. That's the last one. Until, of course, the next one.
But before we can go into that one, we have to talk about this one. This is so good. Well, for most of it, there's no Captain Underpants, Tippy, or action or anything we come to expect from the series, it's still really good. I mean, it has it all. Comedy, hilarious satire on the school system, time travel mechanics. It's a long haul, sure, but I think it's all worth it and the Wedgie McGee twist blew my mind as a kid. This one is probably the first one that I would say adults get more out of than kids would. But I'm sure you all want to see how Tippy's story ends, so let's get on to the next one. So, we're back with George and Harold. George being the giant zombie near on the left with... Okay, I'm done with this joke, like, for real this time. Anyway, after some sarcastic commenting on outrage over a kid's book, it's revealed Tippy never actually died. In fact, it was misdirection. See, big things move really slow, so Tippy had a lot of time to avoid the stomp and decided to place a ketchup packet underneath its foot. Why? I have no idea. Anyway, this book claims to reveal all the secrets of the universe, and it actually delivers on that promise, so let's get into it. Tippy decides he's gonna stop himself from messing up the past, so he goes back in time to 10 minutes before he went back in time the first time. He waits at the edge of the school and freezes the bullies when they run out. Then, Tippy appears. The Tippy from the last book who is slightly younger. Future Tippy tells past Tippy what happens if the bullies get scared. He then shrinks down past Tippy to the side of a baseball. Big Tippy puts Tiny Tippy into his jacket pocket before time traveling back to the future, the hell was that? Whatever. He goes back just before the bullies get unfrozen. Then, we finally get the follow-up to the scene at the end of Book 8. Tippy arrives in the present, just as George and Harold are getting arrested, and freezes the cops. Tippy chases them all day, and when George and Harold finally get a break, decide that they shouldn't make Crackers and Sulu suffer with them, and make a plan to put Crackers and Sulu back in the dinosaur age. As they run into the school to get to the purple potty, Mr. Krupp spots them and begins chasing them. They get into the library and lock it just in time. They get into the potty as Mr. Krupp enters, but unfortunately, Tippy finds them. Luckily, they're able to time travel just before they get frozen. Then, Tippy gets the brilliant idea to let Tiny Tippy go back in time and figure out where they're going. The scene plays out normally again, and when they leave, Tiny Tippy comes out and tells Big Tippy where they went. He grabs the new Tiny Tippy and puts him in his jacket pocket. Meanwhile, or I guess not meanwhile, but 65 million years ago, but to us it's happening at the same time, since when Tippy goes back in time 65 million years ago, he appears a couple seconds after them, but that's because, look, time travel gets confusing, especially considering how Tiny Tippy never would have gone back in time to learn where George and Harold are going, and okay, I'll save my time travel criticisms for the end of the book, that way you can just skip it if you want. So George, Harold, Cracker, Sulu, and Mr. Krupp are back 65 million years ago. They go to help Mr. Krupp from falling from the tree, but Tippy appears and begins kicking the tree causing Mr. Krupp and the Purple Potty to fall. The potty breaks and Mr. Krupp hits the ground, confused as to why he isn't hurt. Crackers, of course, grab the boys and is now flying with them, and the boys snap their fingers, turning Krupp into Captain Underpants. Luckily, he was carrying a box of red curtains with black dots, so he's able to get into his full costume. As Tippy begins chasing our heroes with dinosaurs, the two tiny Tippies decide to leave Big Tippy and go back in time to when their robot torso got removed to get the Goosey Grow and get back to regular size. So, they do that. Honey? said a mother who was setting her dinner table. Two little pairs of pants are walking around in our ambrosia salad. Oh really? said her son. And I'm the one seeing a therapist? They make their way to the fight and grab the goosey grow from the wreckage. Slightly younger Tiny Tippy gets duped into growing Tiny Tippy first, and now Tiny Tippy becomes Super Mega Tippy. Of course, he doesn't return the favor and betrays slightly younger Tiny Tippy. Meanwhile, 65 million years ago, Big Tippy is our heroes at the edge of a cliff overlooking a lake. He jumps off the dinosaur he's riding, grabbing Captain Underpants and they fall into the lake, turning Captain Underpants back into Mr. Krupp. They try to snap to turn him back, but his head is still wet, so it's no use. Of course, this led to Tippy discovering the secret, and just as he's about to finally defeat Captain Underpants, Super Mega Tippy appeared behind him. Super Mega Tippy tries to take over, but Tippy doesn't let him, after revealing Captain Underpants' weakness, of course, and he pulls out a nuke from the crack of the butt in the pants and arms it as an act of mutually assured destruction. Unfortunately for Tippy, Super Mega Tippy thinks fast, he snips the arm holding Mr. Krupp, steals him, then kicks Big Tippy all the way across the earth into the Gulf of Mexico. Then his nuke blows up, starting the Cenozoic Era. Super Mega Tippy gets out of there and travels 64,793,216 years in the future, and our heroes decide to join him. Super Mega Tippy is surprised to see George held Crackers and Sulu, but misses slightly younger Tiny Tippy crawling down his shirt. Slightly younger Tiny Tippy sabotages the Robo Pants, reversing the polarity of the emulsifying sausage flange inhibitor 
switches the blue and green wires of the reverse symbolulating Tracto McFractionalizer, and snips the wires of the Freeze Beam 4000's off button. Super Mega Tippy has all our heroes in his grasp, but is distracted when George and Harold point out cavemen are watching them. He looks away for enough time for George, Harold, and Crackers to be freed by Sulu, and they fly away. Tippy ties up Mr. Krupp under a waterfall so his head stays wet. Not gonna comment on any similarities to Chinese water torture. Nope. Anyway, George and Harold go to recruit cavemen, but unfortunately Tippy finds them and they all flee and hide in the cave. George and Harold can't talk to them since they don't speak any language, but they come up with an ingenious solution, the language of drawings. They first draw a mammoth, then Tippy. They decide to make a comic about a baby dino who's enjoying his day until he runs into Tippy. He's chased away by him, and after falling off a cliff, it's found by Ook and Gluck, characters from another George and Harold comic. They come up with a plan and make Tippy fall off a cliff, drop wood on his head, make him kick a mammoth, fall off another cliff, throw a pineapple on his head, get attacked by bees using a makeshift catapult, fall off the cliff again, then hurl a giant boulder at his head. This inspires the cavemen to create their own elaborate plans to defeat Tippy, and they head out to set them up. First they set up a tripwire, which Tippy sees and jumps over, but lands on banana peels, falling over and sliding down the hill of a cliff into a pit of tar. Then they roll boulders off the cliff onto his head. Then they light him on fire. He runs into a nearby pond and emerges completely burnt. Look, I'm not gonna say he doesn't deserve it, but isn't this a bit brutal? No? Well, they then go on to smash his head with more boulders, get him attacked by a rhino, and hit his robot in the crotch with a log. Tippy, in one last attempt to stop them, turns on his Freezy Beam 4000. Unfortunately, due to slightly younger Tiny Tippy's meddling, he is unable to turn it off. Tippy gets encased in ice as slightly younger Tiny Tippy escaped with the Goosey Grow 4000. He sticks the button down so he can use it to grow himself to a massive size, but when he goes to turn it off, he accidentally drops it onto the ice patch that Super Mega Tippy started creating, growing it even more. Our heroes run away and try to get Crackers to fly Sulu somewhere safe, but Crackers seems sick and is unable to fly. So they untie Mr. Krupp, but are too slow and are frozen by the ice. Luckily for them, slightly younger Tiny Tippy wants to kill them himself, so he saves them all from the ice. They begin navigating through this ice age when George and Harold realize that Mr. Krupp's face is now dry, so they snap their fingers and Captain Underpants returns. They come up with a plan and then begin carrying it out. First, Captain Underpants rips the pants off the robot. Then, they use the pants to bring the cavemen to a safe place away from the ice in southern France. Then, they flew back to fight Tippy, who did not seem surprised to see them. I'm not surprised to see you, he says, splashing water on Captain Underpants. They begin falling towards the earth, but luckily, slightly younger Tiny Tippy catches them. George and Harold lament that they're always getting into trouble because of their goofiness and vow to be more serious. Then, they time travel back to the future. What the hell is that? Uh, anyway. They arrive, but everything seems different. Tippy reveals he actually brought them 30 years from where they started. Tippy just wanted to check if he destroyed the world by accident. He places George, Harold, Crackers, and Sulu down as he wants them to watch as he finally destroys Captain Underpants once and for all. George and Harold can't watch as slightly younger Tiny Tippy begins beating up Mr. Krupp, and Sulu begins making a nest for Crackers who seems to only be getting sicker. Behind them, a couple teachers are yelling at kids to start acting like grown-ups and stop paying attention to the fight. Then, a 30-year-older Mr. Krupp pulls up and begins yelling for Mr. Beard and Mr. Hutchins, but walks right past George and Harold towards the two teachers yelling at the kids. Turns out, those teachers are George and Harold in the future. This, of course, causes George and Harold to go back on their vows and stay immature and goofy. Right when they make this vow, the older versions of George and Harold disappear. Look, like I said, I'm not going to complain about the time travel mechanics of a book series meant for 9-year-olds, okay? Let's just move on. George and Harold snap their fingers, turning old Mr. Krupp into old Captain Underpants, who flies up, rescues Mr. Krupp, who George and Harold then turn into Captain Underpants. They then beat up slightly younger Tiny Tippy, who, as a last resort, pulls out another nuke, but it's much bigger this time, and he activated his Graviton Levitator, meaning it's gonna blow up the entire galaxy. They prepare to say goodbye to each other, but Crackers and Sulu get to work. They fly into the cockpit and travel 13.7 billion years into the past, before there even was anything. They're in an empty black void with nothing, except the thermonuclear bomb, which blows up. That's right, Crackers and Sulu caused the Big Bang. Or, sorry, the Big Kabloosh. Meanwhile, back in the time period George and Harold are in, our heroes are confused. They get old Captain Underpants to go turn back into old Mr. Krupp before discovering some eggs in the nest Sulu built for Crackers. Yep, turns out Crackers is a girl. That's why she did the opposite of what she was hypnotized to do. 
Remember that plot point from Book 5? Anyway, George and Harold decide to raise the babies. They begin walking to their houses when suddenly a flash of light appears in front of them. It quickly dissipates, and in its place is Melvin Sneedley in a giant squid costume. Melvin grabs them all and begins teleporting somewhere. Oh no, here we go again. Okay, fine, I'll talk about the time travel mechanics after I talk about this book a little bit. First, I want to say how great a conclusion this is to Tippy slash Poopy Pants story. I mean, the return foreshadowed at the end of the fourth book finally happening, it has to be amazing. This is probably what most kids wanted out of the previous one. This book is so crazy, so much happens. They made dinosaurs go extinct, started the Ice Age, and also did the Big Bang. Sorry, I mean the Big Kabloosh. Not only that, but there were three different versions of Tippy of slightly different ages, two different Captain Underpants, and Crackers was revealed to be a girl. There's the death of Crackers and Sulu, return of Melvin, and defeat of Tippy three times. And a very, 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 very confusing system of time travel that contradicts itself multiple times. So, without further ado, here's my rant on why the time travel in Captain Underpants makes no sense. Okay, where do I begin? Well, the way time travel seems to work at first is by Back to the Future rules. You can change the past, which will affect the future you go back to, but it doesn't affect you unless what you've changed would cause you to not exist. Right? Wrong. When Tiny Tippy goes back in time to learn where George and Harold went, he reveals himself BEFORE Big Tippy sends him to go back in time. Therefore, he would have no reason to send him back in time, therefore, he wouldn't exist. And yet, both Tippies continue to exist. But later, after George and Harold make their vow to keep being silly, their older versions just straight up disappear out of existence. So which is it? Either older George and older Harold should have not disappeared, or Tiny Tippy and slightly younger Tiny Tippy should have both stopped existing after talking to each other. But then there's also the fact that it also tries to make the argument that their time travel is a constant and is always what has happened in the history of the world. I mean, if they caused the Big Bang, then that means that it has to be constant, otherwise the world wouldn't exist. It's a whole, the universe creates crackers and Sulu so that crackers and Sulu can create the universe type of situation. But it can't be that either, because Tippy only goes back in time after George, Harold, and Mr. Krupp get arrested, and it wouldn't have happened the same if they didn't get arrested. Plus, there's a thing with the bullies that get solved with time travel, so it's just not adding up. Come on, Dad Pilkey, I need you to explain in great detail the minute little tiny little details of your time travel in your book made for fifth graders. Let's just move on before I get more heated. So, we rejoin our heroes in the grasp of Melvin and his time-traveling squid robot thing, heading back in time 40 years. Wait, 40 years? Okay, apparently this book retcons the last one so that the finale takes place 40 years in the future rather than 30. Why? I have no idea. Anyway, they arrive 40 years and one day in the past, just as Tippy watches George and Harold disappear in the purple potty. They're back and Melvin just lets them go. He tells them he altered the bank surveillance so they are not in trouble with the law anymore. Why? Well, he says he has his reasons. A whole year's worth of reasons. Remember back in book 5 when that robotic double of Harold kicked a kickball so hard it went flying into space? Well, turns out that ball collided with the head of the giant plumber robot, knocking its head off and spilling juice into the Turbo Toilet 2000, which reawakens it. He quickly realizes what has happened and decides to take revenge. He disassembled the Roboplunger and turned him into a rocket scooter that he would use to fly back to Earth. So what were Melvin's years worth of reasons? Turns out, the cops assumed that George Harold and Mr. Krupp fled the country and were hiding out in either Canada or Mexico, and had essentially given up looking for them. Melvin, of course, was happy they were all gone. But then the Turbo Toilet 2000 arrived. He arrives on Earth and begins destroying the city, much to Melvin's dismay. He tries to get the toilet to quiet down so we can work, but as you can imagine, this backfires, causing the toilet to want to torment Melvin. He chases him all the way back to Jerome Horowitz Elementary, where Melvin hides out in Mr. Krupp's office. This is the only time Melvin actually wanted Captain Underpants' help. He gets poked by one of Mr. Krupp's toenail clippings and throws it away. But then he realizes he can use it to extract his superpowers and begins searching for it. He searches all over, hearing the toilet come closer and closer, before it eventually crashes into Melvin's hiding place. He's grabbed by the shoe as the toenail stabs him in the leg again, so he unties his shoe and jumps out the window. As he runs, he does science 
stuff to the nail, preparing for transfer of the powers. He runs all the way to his lab and at the last second gulps down a vial containing the fruits of his labor. The Turbo Toilet 2000 put Melvin to his mouth, but was surprisingly unable to chew him up. He pulled Melvin out of his mouth, and Melvin utters his signature catchphrase. You are so immature. That's right, Big Melvin is back. Unfortunately, the fight was way too graphic to be depicted in this book, so instead, Davin enlisted the help of a four-year-old boy to draw it, and his grandma to describe it. So, uh, yeah, let's look at those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay, cool. So Melvin defeats the toilet and is declared a hero. Weird Al writes a song about him, he gets a parade, and the vice president writes him a letter. Melvin was finally getting the respect he thought he deserved. Melvin enjoyed being a superhero, until people started calling on his help for menial tasks, like fishing their wallet out of a toilet. But it all became too much one day when Melvin was finally about to finish the experiment he was conducting for almost a year when he heard someone crying for help. Immediately, he shut down the experiment, causing it to blow a 40-foot hole in his bedroom. He arrives at the scene and... Do these pants make me look fat? Of course, this is what led to him wanting Captain Underpants back, so we can deal with the superhero junk while Melvin conducts his experiments. So he finds out where Sulu is based on his GPS, climbs in his time travel squid suit, and has forward in time 29, sorry, 39 years to the schoolyard where George Harold, Mr. Crop, and the three eggs laid by crackers are. So, without explaining any of that, Melvin heads off with the ominous warning of two weeks. Of course, we know that's when the Turbo Toilet 2000 comes back, but they don't. They get Mr. Krupp back to his old self and head on their way, wondering what'll happen in two weeks. They set up the eggs under a couple lengths for heat, then decide to take a well-deserved nap, since they'd been up for 30 hours under the threat of death most of the time. 11 minutes later, their parents angrily call them. They found out George and Harold hadn't been at school that day, and don't believe their explanation, so they force them to do chores for the rest of the day. By night, they are dead tired, but unfortunately, George remembers that the next day is test day, so they have to spend all night studying. By morning, they can barely function. George can't put food in his mouth, and Harold can't respond properly to questions. Also, he's pouring milk on top of a sandwich on top of a book. They get ready to head to school, but Harold wants to check on the eggs. Unfortunately, this leads to both George and Harold falling asleep and missing the whole day. They leave the treehouse, but their parents seem to be none the wiser. Apparently, the school hadn't called them. When George and Harold arrive at school the next day, Mr. Krupp seems very happy to see them. As they walk the halls, the entire faculty laughs maniacally at George and Harold. When they arrive in his office, Mr. Krupp reveals his evil plan. Since they skipped test day, Mr. Krupp came up with a brilliant plan to separate the two of them. He cancelled the final exams, and all homers set their current grades are final after getting zeros in all their tests. George passes the fourth grade, but Harold doesn't. Mr. Krupp finally won and is now able to separate them. They leave and immediately come up with a brilliant plan to steal Melvin's time machine and go back in time one day to take the test. Of course, they arrive and have created two time travel suits, and I'm sure nothing will come of that. They head to school, actually happy to go and take a test for once. After school, they head to the treehouse to discover that, of course, they were already there, asleep. Yesterday George and yesterday Harold wake up and find George and Harold there. Quickly, they explain what happened. Of course, they think this is terrible until the Georges come up with a system. George and Harold will do homework and go to school on even-numbered days, and yesterday George and yesterday Harold will do that on odd-numbered days. While the other pair are off working, they get to slack off and do whatever. They stay up all night watching movies, and they even order pizza. The next morning, however, they realize a problem. They can't go into the house to use the bathroom, and they're hungry but are out of money. The bathroom problem is solved by the two two-liter bottles of root beer they ordered the night before, but the other one requires something more. They decide to make a comic and sell on the playground, even though they're not supposed to be at school. They figure they'll be fine as long as they're never in the same place, and they get to work. With their new comic, they head to school to photocopy it, but are caught by Miss Anthro. They convince her she's dreaming, and as proof, they use the fact that they can ask Miss Ribble if they're in class. She obviously confirms, she asks her to send them down to the office. When they arrive, she's convinced fully, and immediately takes off her dress and leaves. The yesterdays get mad that they came to school despite it not being their day, and this angers George and Harold, who decide to convince every other teacher that they're dreaming. All of them immediately get into their underwear, start binge eating, and turn the hallway into a slip and slide. Of course, Mr. Krupp is not happy about this, and neither are yesterday George and yesterday Harold. Mr. Krupp once again loses his mind seeing two copies of George and Harold. Then the cops show up hauling the teachers to prison, and Mr. Krupp to the home for the reality challenge. They quickly realize that the craziness had caused two weeks to flash by, and realize that whatever Melvin warned them about would soon come. But nothing happened. Until a couple seconds later, of course, when the Turbo Toilet 2000 came rocketing in from outer space. 
The boys immediately run to where they're keeping Mr. Krupp, but are turned away, so they come up with a new plan. They create talking toilet disguises and convince the Turbo Toilet 2000 to break in to get Mr. Krupp. Immediately, George and Harold take the intercom and begin snapping, turning Mr. Krupp into Captain Underpants. He begins beating the Turbo Toilet 2000, who is easily defeated, but unfortunately, his tears turn Captain Underpants into Mr. Krupp, who immediately turns tail and runs away screaming. He grabs Mr. Krupp and wonders aloud how he's going to find the two kids, and Mr. Krupp reveals he knows where they live and gives them directions to his house. The Yesterdays are there, hiding in the treehouse after hearing him come for them. The Turbo Toilet 2000 swallows Mr. Krupp whole, then begins running into the tree over and over, causing everything in there to go flying, including Cracker's eggs, which hit the ground and break open. They search through the eggshells and find a hamster and pterodactyl hybrid, which remind me of the drunkies from Shrek. The babies immediately bond with George and Harold, who just as quickly get grabbed by the Turbo Toilet 2000. The creatures see that they're in trouble and begin fighting the Turbo Toilet 2000. The creatures grab the toilet, carry him high into the air, and drop him, causing him to hit the ground and shatter. Mr. Krupp gets hauled off to prison with the other teachers, leaving the boys to speculate on how the hell these creatures came to be. They decide not to think about it because it's too gross. They make beds for them and name them Don, Orlando, and Tony. Then, George says, if you look too closely at these stories, they're gonna fall apart which I am entirely guilty of. But to be fair, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief for a real hypno ring, a copy machine that makes things on paper real, aliens and superpower juice, a country where everyone has goofy names, the hypno ring not working on girls correctly for some reason, a bionic booger boy, a time traveling purple potty, and a bionic hamster mating with a pterodactyl, but I draw the line at somewhat shoddy time travel mechanics, all right? Even I have a limit. Anyway, they soon realize that, because there are too many loose ends, there's definitely going to be another book. Oh no, here we go again, for the last time. I'm going to be honest, this one's just okay. The Turbo Toilet 2000 just isn't that menacing to me. It's cool they finally actually paid off the thread that had been built up since the second book, but still. I don't know, it's just kind of anticlimactic. They have to set up these convoluted reasons for Captain Underpants to not immediately just defeat the Turbo Toilet 2000 because now that he has superpowers, he's like a piece of cake. And it just kind of ruined the stakes for me. Yeah, this is fun to read and it's funny, but it just kind of feels lamer compared to previous books, especially as a follow-up to Tippy's story. But I can see why following up the best villain in the entire series would be difficult. Regardless, let's move on to the final book. Humans are dumb. We created smart things, but also dumb things. Also big dangerous things. Enter Smart Earth. Everyone is smart because the planet is made of Zygo Gogo Zizzle 24, which makes people smart. It also mixes well with mayo and dill pickle relish to create a nice salad dressing, but also a fuel that can power an entire city. One day, someone on Smart Earth decides to mix Smart Coke with Smart Mentos and blows up the entire planet, killing billions of people. Truly a horrific event that must have traumatized millions of kids due to its depiction in this book. But anyway, it also causes a piece of the smart earth to fly all the way to regular dumb earth. Where does it land? Well, the insane asylum all the teachers are in, of course. Mr. Meaner immediately eats it, and this gives him intelligence on par with the people of smart earth. Let's hope he doesn't blow up the planet. He heads for the exit, but is obviously stopped by the staff, so he presents them with a paradox to distract them allowing him and the other teachers to escape. Now, Mr. Aminer could use his intellect to solve the world's problems, but because we all know gym teachers are inherently evil, he doesn't. Instead, he decides he's gonna do something about the disobedient children. He instructs the teachers to continue as normal until his plan is ready, and they do. The next day, it's Yesterday George and Yesterday Harold's turn to go to school, and after misbehaving, Mr. Aminer decides to test his work on them. He brings them into his office and sprays them with his special serum. Now, George and Harold have ADHD and they're proud of it, but this spray essentially reverses it into something known as ASLS, Attention Superfluous Lethargy Syndrome, turning them into model students. This impresses all the teachers, and Melvin of course. Even Mr. Krupp is impressed, and now Mr. Meaner was planning to sell his product to parents with misbehaving kids. Yesterday George and Yesterday Harold return home with a ton of extra homework, and George and Harold are immediately suspicious of the Yesterdays. The Yesterdays do their half of the homework while George and Harold work on comics. After, the Yesterdays bring them dinner and go to bed and leave George and Harold to do their half. Luckily, the Yesterdays offer to go to school tomorrow as well, which is good because working all night on the work makes them sick. The next day, Mr. Meaner comes to school in a mech suit called the Stinky Kong 2000, 
that sprays his concoction out of his armpits. He sprays his flute on every kid in the school, turning them all into nerds that follow the command of every adult, with adults staying unaffected. The only downside is that it needs to be reapplied every day, but that's where his plot comes in. Once the parents realize how obedient their children are, they'll pay great money for the spray. Anyway, as the week goes on, George and Hill get more and more swamped and more and more sick. They take a break to watch TV and see Mr. Meaner's commercial for Riddle Kid 2000. They decide, despite being sick and unable to even breathe through their nose, to go to school and investigate. They find a disguise and head to school where they find the teachers, of course, abusing their powers and getting the kids to do their chores. They realize the kids have been turned into slaves, and, before escaping, decide to have a little fun. They get the kids to mess everything up. The teachers wake up with markers all over them, hair chopped off, tax forms done in pig Latin, clothes ripped, and cars full of cottage cheese. They furiously report this to Mr. Meaner, who gets in his cottage cheese filled car to investigate, passing a house with kids painting the lawn, mowing the flowers, and watering the house. He asks the kids who told them to do it, and deduces it wasn't actually an adult, but a kid. So he goes around town, spraying the entirety of it with his spray. George and Harold go to their parents for help, but overhear a conversation they're having with the brainwashed yesterdays. I don't know what's come over those two boys lately, said George's dad, but I like it. Me too, said Harold's mom. They've really grown up these past few days. It feels like their whole personalities have changed, said George's mom. What an improvement! They walk away and decide to get help from some adults they can really trust. They run to Melvin's garage, get in the time-traveling squid costume, and travel 20 years into the future. They ask someone where they can find George Beard, and he asks, Oh, you mean the author? And George gets so excited that he's an author in the future. Harold tries to calm him down and continues asking the kid, who then says he lives on the hill next to the graphic artist, Harold Hutchings or something. This, of course, causes Harold to get just as excited. They head to the house of future George, and he's justifiably surprised seeing his child self and child best friend at his door. His wife invites them inside, and they immediately accept the invitation, ogling over all the cool stuff old George has. They then spot a treehouse in the backyard, and old George reveals that it's not for them, but for their kids. Adult George gathers their kids while his wife calls old George and his husband over. They get introduced to the family, old George's wife Lisa, their two kids, Nick and Mina, Harold's husband Billy, and their two kids, who are twins, Owen and Kay. George and Harold tell their adult selves that they need their help since they're the only adults they can trust. They start to leave, but George and Harold want to read more Dogman, but the adults say that it's time sensitive, despite having access to time travel, so time isn't really a factor, but whatever. They read it, say it's pretty good for old people, offending the adults, then leave. They arrive in the present, past, whatever. They arrive in the time they left, which we will call the present, and make their way to the treehouse. They meet up with Tony, Orlando, and Dawn, who they say mysteriously disappeared one day. They tell George and Harold to stay in the treehouse while the adults go to stop Mr. Meaner. They head to Mr. Krupp's house, who was busy scrubbing permanent marker off his face, and snap to get him to turn into Captain Underpants. Unfortunately, since his face is still wet, he stays Mr. Krupp. They frantically snap in his face over and over as Mr. Meaner makes his way down in the Stinky Kong 2000. Mr. Krupp calls them adults acting like kids, which catches Mr. Meaner's attention, somewhat correctly but also incorrectly making the assumption that they are the adults that sabotage the school kids. He picks them up and beats them in epic flip o fashion, but Mr. Krupp tells him not to kill them because it'll mess up his lawn. Luckily, he dried his face during the ordeal, with a red with black polka dot towel no less, so they get him to turn into Captain Underpants. Now, it's Mr. Meaner's turn to get flip o -Ramad. He destroys the Stinky Kong 2000 and is sent to jail. Unfortunately, it's the jail with Warden Schmorden. Mr. Meaner gets to make him an egg salad sandwich with extra dill pickle relish, which, if you remember, creates a very powerful energy source. He eats it and turns into a giant being of pure energy. He becomes Sir Stinks a lot. He begins terrorizing the city, but Captain Underpants is quick. Old George and Old Harold are cheering him on, which Sir Stinks a lot take notice of. He slams his fist onto them, absorbing them into his body. He learns their memories, which unfortunately makes them privy to Captain Underpants' weakness. He lures him to a pond and splashes him with water, turning him back into Mr. Krupp. He falls from the sky, but lives, surprising both Mr. Krupp and Sir Stinks a lot. He uses his power to scan his DNA and realizes he has superpower juice in there. He performs a superpower juicectomy, and now Mr. Krupp is powerless. Unfortunately for Sir Stinks a lot, George and Harold were also affected by the Zygo Go Go Zizzle and now know everything about it, from its chemical makeup to even the events that destroyed Smart Earth. They send out a telepathic signal to the treehouse, but unfortunately George and Harold are asleep. Luckily, they're not the only things in the treehouse. Sir Stinks a lot gloats, talking about taking over the world with his Riddle Kid serum, but Tony, Orlando, and Dawn fly in with Diet Coke, Mentos, and Pop Rocks, which they drop inside Sir Stinks a lot, and, to make a long story short, 
Chef Gold Bloom. The explosion sends the Zygo Go Go Zizzle into space, and Sir Stinks a lot disintegrates. Old George and Old Harold emerge unharmed, and the crowd cheers. Don, Orlando, and Tony emerge as well, and the crowd cheers again. Mr. Meaner emerges, and the crowd is not happy. George and Harold wake up to a normal city in clear noses. They peek through their window at Yesterday George and Yesterday Harold sleeping soundly. The Ritta kid will wear off soon. They meet up with Old George, Old Harold, Don, Tony, and Orlando, and they tell their younger selves about the adventure as they walk back to the hill. They walk past Mr. Krupp, and a jogger runs by snapping. However, instead of turning into Captain Underpants, he just yells at her. No one knows how, but the hypnotic curse is over. They arrive back at Echo Hills and climb into the squid. They tell them they did pretty good for old people before traveling back to the future. What is that? Old George and Old Harold are reunited with their families, and George and Harold are about to go home when George thinks of something. We've got our own time machine. We could go anywhere we want. We can explore time together. We can go on awesome new adventures. Wow, said Harold. That sounds like fun. What should we do first? Let's go rescue Crackers and Sulu. How in the world are we ever going to do that? Asked Harold. We'll figure something out, said George. We always do. They wave goodbye to their future families and disappear into a ball of light. A few hours had passed and the Riddle Kid 2000 had finally worn off. Yesterday George and Yesterday Harold were back to their old selves again, but nothing around them seemed normal at all. I wonder where George and Harold went, said Yesterday George. I have no idea, said Yesterday Harold. And where did Tony, Orlando, and Don go? asked Yesterday George. Beats me, said Yesterday Harold. It seems like they just disappeared. Yesterday George and Yesterday Harold didn't know what had happened, or why everything had turned out okay. But it seemed like things were going to be just fine from now on, and they were grateful. Well, what should we do now? asked Harold. Let's make a new comic book, said George. About Captain Underpants? asked Harold. Nah, said George. Let's do something different. How about a Dogman comic? Okay, said Harold happily. And together, the two friends wrote and drew and laughed all afternoon. And that was Captain Underpants. Pretty good, right? Such a perfect way to end it. It leaves the door open if Dav Pilkey ever wants to, you know, return to the series, but it doesn't leave you wanting more. And as cool as George and Harold's time traveling adventures would be, I don't think I actually want him to follow up on that. I mean, it wouldn't even be Captain Underpants anymore anyway, because Captain Underpants doesn't exist. Regardless, this is a very good book and a perfect finale. Something I love about these books nowadays that I didn't really as a kid and I've kind of glossed over until now is that a lot of the jokes in these books are clearly born out of Dave's disdain for the American school system. I mean, having ADHD and dyslexia in the school system, especially when Dav was a kid, must have been really hard. You can really tell that Dav was just like George and Harold, and the teachers are exaggerated versions of the teachers he had. I have to imagine Dav did not like his gym teacher because he's always dying in George and Harold's comics and nobody cares, which is what makes him a perfect antagonist for the final book. It was honestly genius, I mean the setup was there from the very first book. That way he can give the previous two villains that were set up their time in the limelight, while also having a villain that was set up for the final book but one that doesn't really need to have the focus so that he can focus more on showing George and Harold's future. Which by the way was brilliant. And the twist of them actually being Yesterday George and Yesterday Harold caught me by surprise even now. Also I didn't even like bring any attention to it but Harold having a husband that the book also doesn't really bring much attention to is just the perfect way to do it. Anyway, it's time for the ranking part of this retrospective and ranking. Number 12, Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets. While a good book, it's kind of just a run of the mill Captain Underpants, it doesn't really add much or change the status quo. I mean, yeah, the Turbo Tele 2000 does come back, but that only affects two books. Otherwise, it's a good Captain Underpants book and a solid sequel. Number 11, Captain Underpants and the Tyrannical Retaliation of the Turbo Toilet 2000. Perhaps there's a reason the two toilet books are at the bottom. The Turbo Toilet 2000, and by extension the Talking Toilets, just never felt that intimidating to me. Especially in this book where they just turn him into a big joke. I mean, it's a comedy series so that's fine, but he's so underpowered that a superpowered Captain Underpants can just destroy him, so they come up with these convoluted reasons that he couldn't. And as a follow-up to the Tippy Tinkle Trousers story, yeah, this is very disappointing. Number 10, Captain Underpants and the Invasion of the Incredibly Naughty Cafeteria Ladies from Outer Space, 
and the subsequent assault of the equally evil lunchroom zombie nerds. When you have 12 great books, being in a bottom spot is not very indicative of your quality. This is just a solid Captain Underpants book that doesn't do anything particularly great, but it's not bad either. It's basically average Captain Underpants to me. The aliens and giant nerds were never really that interesting to me. Not bad, just not really that interesting. This just slightly edges out the previous two on this list because despite being of similar quality, this has probably the biggest status quo shift in the entire series, that being Cat and Underpants actually getting superpowers. It was something that had to happen if the Cat and Underpants series was going to continue getting bigger and better, and they did it in such a perfectly Cat and Underpants way. Number 9. Cat and Underpants, the first epic novel. Much like the previous entry, there's not much wrong with this. It doesn't do anything particularly great, but it's just a good first entry. In the scope of the quality of Captain Underpants, it's not really anything special. The art style sticks out to me after reading all the 12 because it kind of gets more and more... I don't want to say homogenized, but I think you know what I mean. But I still really like the way it looks. Number 8. Captain Underpants and the Big Bad Battle of the Bionic Booger Boy Part 1 The Night of the Nasty Nostril Nuggets this is the first book that I would consider great over just being really good. Don't really have much to say beyond that. Number 7. Captain Underman's and the Revolting Revenge of the Radio Active Robo Boxers. Honestly, I'm surprised this one is only this high. It's pretty telling when number 7 on the list can be described as one of my favorites. I mean, it's the conclusion to the story of who could be called the main villain of Captain Underpants considering he's in the most books and was also the villain chosen for the movie. He's certainly the most iconic. Number 7 seems low, but it bears repeating that this list is filled with great books. Number 6, Captain Underpants and the preposterous plight of the purple body people. This one is so good. I love alternate universe stories and this one does it pretty much perfectly. My only criticism is that they don't do the Underpants v Blunderpants fight. The alternate universe versions of the characters are great, and I love that Captain Blunderpants wears the toupee instead of Mr. Krupp. Almost makes me think that the toupee is what makes them evil. Hmm. Number 5. Captain Underpants and the Big Bad Battle of the Bionic Booger Boy Part 2 The Revenge of the Ridiculous Robo Boogers. It's good. Number 4. Captain Underpants and the Wrath of the Wiki Wedgie Woman. This one surprised me. This and Purple Potty were the two I remembered least, and that sucks because this one is really good. Despite the whole Hypno ring working the opposite on women thing, being kind of contrived? This is Captain Underpants, so who cares? Number three, Captain Underpants and the Central Song of Sisting's Lot. I said pretty much everything I want to say about this book in the last section, so yeah, it's it's good. Number two, Captain Underpants and the Perilous Plot of Professor Poopy Pants. This may seem high to some people, but it really is just that good. It's the introduction to Poopy Pants, and it's got really, really good jokes. The name-changing billboard affecting the actual text of the book is one of the funniest things in the entire series to me, which is why I integrated it into the script. Overall, just a very, very good book. Mm, number one, Captain Underpants and the Terrifying Return of Tippy Nimble Treasures. You know, I vividly remember hating this book as a kid. It baited me. I was so ready for the Captain Underpants vs. Tippy fight that I've been waiting for years for that I kind of got distracted from the great Georgian Herald origin story. Miraculously, while reading through these for this video, I found that this one was actually my favorite. This was my least favorite, and now it's my favorite. How crazy is that? Let me punctuate this video with a story of my own. Bear with me here, it's kind of long, but it's it's worth it. And you've stayed this long, I think you can bear another like five minutes. When I was a kid, I hated going to school. It was really hard for me, harder than probably most of the other kids in my class. I had a hard time doing my work and my desk was pretty much always messy, which the teachers didn't really like. I brought a sort of I don't want to be here right now vibe to the class that the teachers didn't appreciate. Almost every report card that I've gotten says that I'm a joy to have in class, but I need to apply myself. Then came grade 6. I got the teacher that nobody likes. He would yell all the time and get kids in trouble for the most menial things. He was basically a real life Mr. Krupp. So clearly me and him were the perfect match. Mr. Krupp, which is what I'm going to call him from now on, didn't like me very much. I talked too much and I didn't do my work a lot of the time. This resulted in me being yelled at all the time, having my desk moved next to him, all things of that sort. If I wasn't working, he'd yell at me. If I was looking around to think, which is what I do, he'd yell at me. Anything I did that wasn't a regular person working, I would get yelled at. One time, because my printing was less than stellar, 
He walked into the room with a kindergarten learn how to write book and just held it in front of me. I grabbed it and quickly put it in my desk in order to avoid embarrassment, but he told me to give it back and that he would only give it to me actually if my printing didn't improve. That's the level we're dealing with here. The only time I was happy at school was when I was hanging out with my friends during recess or lunch. But after forgetting my PE clothes too many times, he made me stay inside during those to work on this essay about basketball. As someone who didn't like sports, I didn't really connect with this work, so I never actually finished it. I started staying home from school more and more often, but when you stay home from school, my family has a rule that you don't get to go on electronics. So I read books. Of course, I was limited to the books I had on my shelf and whatever I took out from the school library, so I read the same books over and over. Those books being books like Big Nate, Bone, Dive Wimpy Kid, and of course, Captain Underpants. I read about George and Harold, these misfit kids who struggled with mean teachers. But more importantly, in the About the Author section, I read about Dav Pilkey. He was a kid like me. He was someone who struggled in school as well. He had ADHD and dyslexia and was punished by his teachers for that. He spent most of his time out in the hall, somewhere I know quite well, just drawing and writing. And that's where he came up with Captain Underpants. And reading about this kid who turned into a writer, something I found that I enjoyed because of my books inspired by Captain Underpants, it inspired me. It helped me get through school and I have Dav Pilkey to thank for that. So thank you Dav Pilkey for showing all the Georgian Heralds out here that teachers are the one with the attitude problems. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, George and Harold are insane psychopaths who do nothing but torment the people around them and- Anyway, join me next time when I cover the movie, Super Diaper Baby, Ukin Glock, Dogman, maybe the TV show? I'm not sure on that last one to be honest, but I will be covering the rest of the Pilkyverse. At least when it comes to the projects that are under the Captain Underpants umbrella.